Um, so there you go. <laughs> And I'll just um, set out how the program is going to be for this morning. We've scheduled from um, 10 until 11 o'clock. So we're gonna start off with a short presentation and, and a video from Dean Bebe from ACRP about a mural that we've done as part of this launch event and, and the launch of the coalition. We're then going to move on to some comments from the coalition ahead of the budget speech happening on Wednesday from Ali Akaji from 350.org. Then we'll have Leanne Gavinsami from the Center for Environmental Rights, speaking to a letter that the coalition has sent off to government last week, um, dealing with aspects of the financing of, the, of South Africa's just transition. And then we'll move on to some questions and um, which will be facilitated by Glenn Tyler Davies by, um, from 350.org. So if during the course of the program, you have some questions for us, Please just pop them into the chat, we'll monitor them and then address them at the end. So that's how our program is going to be today. And thank you all again for joining us. And I'll now hand over to Dean from ACRP. Thank you, Ariella, and welcome everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful morning or afternoon, depending which part of the world you're in, but lovely to be hosting you all. So I really wanted to touch on the mural that we decided to create as a symbol for um, FFSA Fair Finance South Africa's launch uh, to a larger extent. And what I would like to really speak on is how this mural is an art expression um, fundamentally, and it's, it's, it really expresses the current nature of development fin finance institutions in South Africa. It highlights the negative impact that they have had, not only on the environment, but on previously disadvantaged communities. As such, we intend the mural that we've created to be a symbol of artivism by raising awareness. As such, it intends to, 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 to really speak to the social inequalities that exist within South Africa and Africa as a whole, especially in relation to the ongoing climate crisis. The mural epitomizes the values that Fair Finance South Africa embodies, which is really for development finance that is transparent and fair for people and planet. This largely speaks to the urgent need to prioritize the development and implementation of a fossil fuel finance exclusion policy and to enhance viable, transparent, and accountable mechanisms and infrastructures within development finance uh, institution fr uh, frameworks. The mural is therefore a symbol of the new world rising, one that is equitable and just and the values and really just really speaks to the values of human rights um, and also speaks to the values of ecological conservation. It encourages and speaks to reimagining what impactful investment looks like for tomorrow's futures and how that would look like for Africa as a whole. So without further ado, I would like one of my colleagues to then play the video for all of us and please do drop a chat on that, how you think. Thank you. This work is important firstly to ensure that as many people understand how the development finance world works. So the more transparency there is, people can actively participate in decisions being made or at least appreciate uh, the extent to which those decisions are, are being made and how that's going to impact on them. In particular, the Fair Finance Coalition has focused on the Industrial Development Corporation and the Development Bank of South Africa since they are responsible for channeling funds towards specific developmental projects. The goal we hope to achieve as Fair Finance South Africa is to use our methodologies to create evidence-based research that will help us achieve climate justice in the face of an ongoing climate crisis. But it goes beyond and further than that. We want to create social justice as we seek climate justice as well. Fair Finance South Africa. For development finance that is transparent and fair. For people and planet. Thank you, everyone. So that's pretty much how the mural looks. Um, but if you would like to get a closer look, the location is at 25 Adela Crescent, Randwick Ridge, Extension 9. Um, it's at the Black Wall property facing John Foster's Road. And please, when you do uh, get there, please don't hesitate to take a picture with the mural and please put it up on your social medias with the hashtag Fair Finance South Africa. 
On that note, I'd like to hand back to my colleague, Ariella. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean, and, and thank you for coordinating that. I think we can all get an indication of how beautiful that mural is looking. And just a heads up that there will be a longer version of that video to be uploaded to our website. Um, and we will pop the website address into the, the chat so that you can access that because I think that's something really exciting and, and front facing for all of us to be able to appreciate. Um, so now to hand over, as I said, to Ali Akaji from 350.org, who's going to speak a bit about the upcoming budget speech and, and what the Fair Finance Coalition is expecting from the, the Minister of Finance this week. Thanks, Ariella. Um, I hope I'm clear and my background is the right way. Uh, it's the first time I'm seeing the video and mural as well, so it's quite exciting starting with such a visual and as we go into the content. Um, so my name is Alia. I am the public finance campaigner for 350africa.org. And we've really been talking about how can we connect with the public budget process, particularly as it sets out the context for the DFIs that we, we focus on. And as we lead up to the 2022 budget, reflections from diverse stakeholders have all agreed that our economy lacks a consensus. Dangerously, this is at a time where coordination and cohesion are essential when addressing the climate crisis as civil society, as citizens, as country, as a region. With a highly carbon intensive economy, the core of this crisis is how we achieve a just transition and a transition to a low carbon uh, and resilient society without disproportionately risking affected workers and communities. Ultimately, this transition requires a transformation of our existing economy, the incentives it creates and the institutional arrangements that follow. However, we anticipate that Wednesday's speech will show just how far away we are from the transformational shift that we need. The public budget is one third of the spend in the economy with an idea of tax or revenue collection, what departments have to spend or how much is owed in debt in the plan to repay. It offers the context of an resource allocation for how we address the developmental challenges of unemployment, inequality, poverty, and the climate crisis. Alongside desperate needs of economic growth after years of stagnation and a growing population, there is recognition of development encompassing social and environmental well being. And so the focus of this coalition is on public development finance institutions who have that political mandate of inclusive and sustainable development to address inequality and resource challenges. Arguably, DFIs step in to address market failures of the private sector. In order to meet the Paris Agreement of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, a simultaneous shift away from fossil fuels and towards sustainable and resilient investment is needed. The State of the Nation addresses endorsement, SONA's endorsement of developing an upstream gas industry poses a threat to our climate ambitions. This considering reports from the IPCC and the International Energy Association and agency, unequivocally stating no new fossil fuel developments can take place if we hope to maintain the goals of Paris. Worryingly, Ramaphosa's emphasis on the private sector and removal of red tape raises a number of red flags when considering the government's intention to enable the private sector as opposed to regulate the private sector. Mention of renewable energy in the speech did present some hope in terms of alternative and clean generation capacity. However, continued and new investment in fossil fuels threaten to undermine the wider benefits of renewables. Fossil fuel extraction and production exacerbate the climate crisis and the extreme weather impacts undermine development gains. According to the Climate Policy Initiative, South Africa faces up to 18 trillion rand in, in transition risk if the world aligns with the Paris Agreement and we do not address our carbon intensity, an amount that would fall onto the public budget. In addition to billions in public subsidies to the coal, oil and gas industry and the 500 billion rand price tag for the human and environmental damages of the extractive sector. So this contradiction plays out at an institutional level as well. Despite the green institutional capacity and funding, institutions such as the Development Bank of Southern Africa have still been linked to fossil fueled projects such as the power ships. While it's pending in South Africa, they're still operational in Ghana or linked to the Mozambique and liquid natural gas project as well, notorious for playing a role in political instability and the displacement of hundreds of families. 
Despite claims of inclusive development, there is no transparency on the details of these projects, leaving the public or primarily affected groups unable to the, assess the extent of project impacts. When legally challenged to provide this information, the protection of project details in the name of market sensitivities was proclaimed. The protection of the private sector signals the neoliberalism of our economy with deregulation and removals of red tape to efficiently allow the market to allocate resources. However, the profit motives of the private sector have well-known market failures in the form of externalized human rights abuses and environmental damages. The private sector has time and time again failed to put people first. Despite government's punting of infrastructure-led development to address our challenges, Research has shown that de-risking the private sector to invest, particularly in infrastructure, perpetuates inequality rather than addresses it, as the private sector prioritizes in terms of profit potential rather than need. As such, underserved areas are not good business cases. Similarly, the economic reconstruction and recovery plan within a neoliberal context can hardly build back better post-COVID in a manner that targets inequality at its core. The colonial and economic roots of our fossil fuel economy are best described by the mineral energy complex, a system of accumulation that relies on the exploit relied and relies on the exploitation of black labor and social reproduction alongside land dispossession. As argued by political economists, this has not only given South Africa a highly disproportionate carbon emission per capita, but has distorted effects on the industrial sector that have shaped structural unemployment. Orthodox economic policies fail to recognize social and political and environmental challenges and cannot expect the market to resolve them if allowed free reign. In 2021, the midterm budget policy statement indicated a prioritization of debt servicing through an austerity approach. The reduced resource allocation to public services and their capacity threatens their ability to hold the private sector accountable to public priorities. With the aim of de-risking the private sector, civil society is left asking, who carries the externalized social risk where government lacks the capacity? The devolving of development to the private sector has never yielded progressive development outcomes. Considering the failures of the mining sector in upholding legal commitments made in social and labor plans, leaving nearby communities in arguable states of underdevelopment. Without a radical shift in the orthodox macroeconomic position, Renewable energy models are highly likely to perpetuate the inequality that we've seen, with independent power producers being able to pass on costs to the consumer through tariff structures. The position of our DFIs to de-risk more private sector investment could hinder longer term ability to localize value chains and actually reap the benefits of the job creation potential of the sector. Despite last year's budget speech making promising mention of National Treasury's technical paper on financing a sustainable economy, this guidance was largely still voluntary and aimed at the private sector as well. It is only beginning to introduce taxonomies for better reporting and disclosure of sustainable financing, but very little attention has been given to the public sector who would hold them to account. Adopting the mainstream economic position places people over profit, whether through fossil fuels or renewable, and the need to prevent rent seeking has already been mentioned in terms of climate finance. The austerity budget as it stands threatens social well-being through reduced service delivery. This is a burden known to be shouldered by women as more responsibilities fall on households. The government's responsibility to protect human rights is not reflected in its economic approach. And when it promises to prioritize the private sector, there's no way to ensure that benefits have trickled down, as we know that they don't. Uh, when we transition away from fossil fuels, cleaner energy may benefit the few that could afford it. Economic growth is needed, undoubtedly, but neoliberal models maintain patterns of inequality. Recognizing some historic oppressions, the just transition framing, particularly in the Presidential Climate Commission, has included aims of procedural, distributive, and restorative justice, but these cannot be aimed for without meaningful, inclusive consultation and strong governance measures. However, climate financing still puts forward ideas of blended models with little to no detail on the structuring of watershed deals such as the Just Transition Partnership that Leanne will touch on later. 
The just transition necessitates a restructuring of our economy to ensure people-centeredness, without which unemployment, poverty, and inequality are set to worsen in the climate crisis. However, our policies maintain an economic orthodoxy that fails to acknowledge and respond to local context and inequity. Without government necessitating permanent features of social protection, such as a universal basic income grant, ambitions of the just transition remain fleeting. Our public development finance institutions are bodies that are meant to represent sustainable and inclusive development, yet are tasked with de-risking projects that could perpetuate harmful patterns through inequality in continued fossil fuels or promote renewable energy through neoliberal and marginalizing methods. Public DFIs hold a constitutional mandate to promote social well-being and environmental protection, yet are not answerable to the public, yet they're have a responsibility to promote the private sector. Where is the transparency in how this balance is made? Finance is not neutral, particularly not within a neoliberal macroeconomy. In an unequal society, it can uphold these inequities unless transformed. The upcoming budget speech is intended as a tool with which to engage the government and hold them accountable to commitments and responsibilities. So much has been done and more too to still be done to shift this national stance. We have some hope if pressure is applied collectively, intersectionally and in solidarity. And this begins with greater transparency at all levels of public finance that enable greater accountability, not just for socioeconomic justice today, but for sustainable and inclusive justice tomorrow. Much of the research I've mentioned here today has come from the Institute for Economic Justice, the Budget Justice Coalition, and many, many members of civil society. And I can share links afterwards. But uh, for now, let me hand back to Ariela. Thank you so much. Thanks so, so much, Alia. And I think what's so powerful there is, is when you said that finance is not neutral. Um, I think that, um, sorry, just before we, we move on to the next part of the program, and just to flag that Alia and, and other Fair Finance South Africa colleagues have drafted, um, ha have, um, drafted an op-ed that is going to be published. Alia, I don't know if there is currently information about its publication or if um, attendees should, should have a look at our website. Again, the website address is in the chat um, if you want to just update us on that. Thanks, Ariella. Uh, it should be published today, I believe, on IOL, uh, but I will confirm with our comms team before the end of this call. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And just a reminder to everyone to please post any questions that you have about the coalition or the content of the discussions that we're having here. Please post those into the chat so that we can flag them and, and address them towards the end of this event. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our colleague Leanne Govinsami from the Centre for Environmental Rights, who's going to speak to a letter that was sent off to, to government um, last week. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's such a privilege to be part of the launch of the Fair Finance Coalition South Africa. Um, as a coalition, we have been working informally for many, many months now. Um, and it really is such a pleasure to be part of the formal launch of the coalition. Um, we have been so far supporting each other's work, including the publication of two financing failure reports, which can be found on the website for the Center for Environmental Rights, as well as on, on Oxfam's website. I will post in the chat um, some of the links to those particular reports. Um, including a letter that went out um, on behalf of a number of civil society organizations, um, which Alia has already mentioned. So, so you can see very clearly that the various coalition members have focused on and built up expertise on a number of development finance institutions, um, including a number of multilateral development banks. We have worked effectively on a number of reports and letters and quite organically built up a strategy for influencing public finance, specifically in respect of climate related finance. So this launch of financing fairly South Africa um, 
comes at such an important and crucial time as South Africa negotiates a climate finance deal that will drive real solutions for South Africa's response to the climate crisis. Alia has already mentioned a lot about what the uh, a just transition would mean. And we believe firmly that our involvement in influencing DFIs and multilateral development banks collectively will really be able to influence the flow of those finances towards a just energy transition. Um, so, so, so really the role of public finance institutions and the influencing power of the coalition is incredibly important. And I'd like to reflect on two areas of work which il illustrates this importance. The first is related to a letter which Ali has already mentioned, which the coalition sent last week together with the Life After Coal campaign, which consists of Groundwork, Earth Life Africa and the Center for Environmental Rights. And this is a letter we sent to the presidency and the recently appointed head of the Presidential Climate Finance Task Team. We sent this letter to ask a number of questions about the $8.5 billion deal agreed to last year at COP26 among a number of different governments um, and South Africa. The agreement really formed part of a political declaration, but hasn't been finalized and, and um, many members of the South African government will refer to this climate finance deal as an offer to the South African government, which now must be negotiated. And our letter really asks questions about the terms of that negotiation. Um, we, we, we note the important development as, uh, as the important development of the appointment of Mr. Manele as the head of the presidential task team. But we've also asked about the terms of the deal. We've noted that any climate finance deal should not fund fossil fuels and importantly should be subject to the consultation and the participation of civil society and community organizations. We regard the financing as being an important part of advancing a just tra energy transition in South Africa and transparency and accountability will be a key part of meeting those objectives. A copy of the letter will be accessible on the Financing Fairly website in, in, in the coming days. I think what's so important here is that oftentimes financing specifically from DFIs and multilateral development banks seems quite far removed from um, coal affected communities, for example, and yet that financing is so essential to the solutions that will see those very communities um, being able to find different solutions, being able to, to live in a healthy environment and breathe clean air. And we regard our role as the coalition to not only engage with DFIs, use our collective influencing power uh, to engage around quite technical aspects of specific deals and specific financing, but we regard our role as being able to share that information and make it accessible to communities who are most affected, but importantly ensure that they are also part of the conversation. I think for too long issues of financing is, have been regarded as too technical, there's been a lot of gatekeeping around information, um, and, and we think that our role, given the, the broad expertise, which is financial, legal, and campaigning expertise amongst the coalition, will be crucial to be able to advance this particular objective. Very briefly, another example of the work being done by the coalition is in respect of climate finance from the Climate Investment Fund, uh, which is being negotiated by South Africa through the Climate Investment Fund, uh, which has established a very specific accelerated coal transition program, which will see potentially between 200, 200 to 500 million USD channeled towards South Africa to advance a just transition. Now, very importantly, one of the MDBs, which manage the climate investment funds or form part of the governance board is the African Development Bank. And the Climate Reality Project, which is one of the coalition members, have been so crucial in many, over many years in engaging with the AFDB. And we think that the, the, the kind of institutional knowledge that has built, been built up 
by ACRP, which is now part of the coalition, and doing this important work will be really crucial in being able to look at this financing, ask questions, being able to access the right decision makers within the bank in order to be able to ask a very necessary and important question. And I think the role of the African Development Bank going forward um, and the ability of the coalition to oversee, be able to ask questions um, and, and be able to demand transparency really um, is, no more, is, is quite important this year, given that COP27 will be in Africa and there will be very keen African focus. So I think I have covered a num at least two issues or two areas of work that we have uh, worked on already as part of a coalition. So we, we are quite an active coalition and I think our focus on the Industrial Development Corporation, the New Development Bank, the Development Bank of South Africa, the African Development Bank, the World Bank to some extent, and the Export Credit Insurance Corporation um, is, is really so um, important because of the range of DFIs that we focus on, but also because of the range of expertise that we hold as a coalition. Um, and very importantly, it is important because we derive our research expertise and ongoing training from Oxfam Nova and Profundo, who have been doing this work for many, many years. So there's a, there's a global element to the work that we're doing, which will be important as we influence um, the northern countries, for example, that have committed particular climate finance to South Africa. So you can see that we, we are engaged in very particular work in South Africa and in, and in relation to very specific MDBs and DFIs. There's a global element to our work in respect of Oxfam Nova, Profundo, and the different organizations that support fair finance globally. And there's also an aspect of our work that links into other fair finance coalitions around the wor world, including the fair finance coalition coalitions in Asia, um, and other developing countries. So we have an opportunity to learn from them and the work that they have been doing in the many years that they've been doing this work. So I think um, I, I have I've indicated some of the work that we're doing, the opportunities for interventions, and we do really look forward to your questions. Um, and I'd just like to say really well done to the coalition members. It's been an incredible journey so far, and we're looking forward to really engaging with you all um, more closely in the months ahead and the years ahead. Um, thank you, Ariella, and thank you, everyone. I'll stop there, and yes, please do put your questions into the chat. Thanks so much, Leanne, for that really important intervention. Um, as Leanne said, today might be our formal launch, but we're already, as the coalition and as the coalition's partners, really busy. Um, this is a fast moving space and a very important space. So again, you can track all of the coalition's activities on our website, which um, we posted the link to the website in the, the chat. And you can also follow us on Twitter and the hashtag Fair Finance SA. Um, I don't currently see any questions in the chat from my side, but I am gonna ask Glenn from 350 to just come on and, and maybe you've directly received some questions. Or if anyone maybe wants to put their hand up and, and has questions they would like to pose um, directly to us. Thanks, Ariella, and thank you everyone again for joining. And thanks to my colleagues and uh, our members who have come before with your excellent inputs. Um, there, I don't see any uh, questions outright in the chat at the moment, so please do add them to the chat or, as Ariella said, you're welcome to put your hand up and, and ask a question either of, about some of our previous work, about what's been shared on this call, or perhaps about our direction going forward. We'd be happy to answer that and we're very lucky to have the majority of our members represented on this call, so we have very knowledgeable people to answer your questions. Um, I don't see any hands at the moment, but um, Jonathan um, Govenda, I did see that you had a question or a comment perhaps in the chat that perhaps you'd like to speak to. Um, essentially, uh, yeah, you ended off by saying that the DFI is acting exactly like banks in their evaluation paradigm. Um, and perhaps you'd like to maybe expand on that a bit or if there's a particular question you'd like to ask us. Hi everybody, I'm not sure if you can hear me. 
Yes, we can hear you well. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, yes, I would like to. Have, first of all, I'm happy that there's an organization like yours that is doing some work to try and hold government to account. And I, and I put the try in inverted commas because um, it's been an ongoing, an ongoing battle. Um, so I, I'm, I'm an analyst for a national um, accounting practice and accounting auditing practice. And we've been working in the space of development as part of our social uh, CSR program. And we've been working with a lot of companies that are um, kind of uh, leaders uh, when it comes to, to, to the green industry. And we've had engagements. I've spoken on the national platforms for Department of Trade and Industry, and especially with regards to, uh, to, to, access, to access, uh, access to finance. And, and the fact of the matter is the hurdles that uh, the SMME sector uh, faces in terms of actually being able to uh, to to access finance is is not supported by DFIs. DFIs fundamentally betray their mandate. If they if you ask them for their terms of reference on on financing, it is exactly the same terms of reference as as a bank would ask. And and ninety percent of the engagement with the uh, with the DFI. Uh, is dependent on the initial engagement with the bank, whereas DFIs should actually be the, the stimulators of development. They should be the ones that are actually stimulating uh, uh, particular segments in order to, to be able to move uh, businesses to, to those that, that, that financing particular stage. And there is not, there, there used to be the support, and let me just stand corrected in saying that I think about uh, 17, 18 years ago, there was that support. But since then, nothing really has happened. You, you're sitting with uh, dealing with DFIs, I, I titled it as 50 first dates. I don't know if you remember the old Adam Sandler movie. It's like every introduction, every meeting you have with the DFI is a reintroduction of who you are because they keep changing people in the organization and you find yourself repeating. And before you know it, a year and a half has gone by. Uh, the actual carrying costs of companies uh, um, uh, affected by outcome decisions. I mean, I'm dealing with one company now that's been in a process with, uh, with the Department of Trade and Industry, the IBC, the IBC and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and a banking institution where the banking institution has come forward with the capital with their commitment to capital, but it's been three and a half years for the DFI to make up its mind because they've changed their committees and their people so many times uh, in terms of the outcome, yet they are willing to send the originators of the technology that is a fundamental uh, green technology uh, to go and represent uh, the Department of Trade and Industry overseas, but they don't want to finance them to realize the project that will actually create jobs. Um, and this is a very big, uh, very big challenge that, that we experience. And we experience it from our clients specifically because you look at the amount of, of effort and the amount of commitment that, uh, that uh, these companies are actually putting into development uh, into, into these projects. And then you see these hurdles um, because every language that you speak, you shouldn't be speaking the same language with a DFI. DFI should have a completely different a different approach to, to, to engaging. But the challenge that I've specifically noticed is that the, and you know, I, I don't want to use the word, uh, I'm going to use a word, but it's not really the right word to use, but it, it's, you're literally dealing with, 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 uh, um, uh, with, with very green people in the sense that they have no understanding of how a business person actually thinks and how, how the actual time frame in, in order to be able to evaluate and turn around. And determine. I've seen, I've spoken at conferences, and I can tell you the number of people that have spent their lives on a promise that they will, that this is what is being offered. And at the end of the day, they come to these conferences and are basic, they basically realize that they wasted four years of their life because number one, they didn't have the key fundamental support on the development of their business cases to the point where those business cases can actually be ready for finance. They don't have those costs. They've funded their, their, their ability to be able to eat uh, and to, 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 to provide food for their family while they're developing this and they still don't get any support. And there's really no, 
Uh, sweat equity has got no value uh, in, in South Africa unless you've got a uh, unless you approach a uh, a VC, and and that's that is what is sad for for me. And and I see those challenges because we work with uh, communities around the coastal areas, uh, even in the solar industry. We we look at at how difficult it is to all the legislative uh, hurdles that they are in place. It's like when the president announced solar projects can go ahead. But what he didn't real, what the, the, the rest of the country didn't realize is that even though the, the president announced that, there's still so much of municipal legislation that has to change in order to be able to, to, to realize a project. And that is five, four, three, four, five years ago, depending on the efficiency of the municipality. So you have this, oh yes, there's this finance. And that is why I, I like what you guys are gonna, and I hope this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna hold the government to task on those those, those, those so-called billions that they are gonna get uh, as to where those billions are actually gonna go and whether or not our time frame uh, in terms of all the legislative changes that actually need to take place, a municipal uh, legislation uh, changes that need to take place in order to be able to cater for it. Uh, the challenge with, uh, with, with in the finance sector is as the government announces things before they actually engage with the with the on the ground people at the municipal levels to understand if the if the MFMA has actually matured to such a level whereby which it can entertain such a such a change because they create the anticipation in order to to satisfy oh we're going to do this in the world but they don't realize that by the time it actually gets done it's like 15 months down the line before even and it's always done in a piecemeal faction uh, factor yeah. faction so that you don't get you don't get the outcome that you should have realized in 11 months like the the, the one solar project everything Thanks, is Jonathan. In can, can i ask you to wrap up yes i'm just saying i i, I think there in as much as you're asking the question there needs to be an evaluation by fair finance of legitimate projects that have actually been affected by uh, these decisions by governments, uh, by, by government and in terms of their process, who makes those decisions at government, because they're not making it in consultation with the, with the actual on the ground SMME sector and the actual business person on the ground. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. You, you've covered a, a lot there, but I can also definitely mm -hmm. hear your, a, your experience um, with these DFIs and also your frustration around some of the working with them here. That's that's clear. And I think just to respond to what you were talking about in terms of the difference between DFIs and um, other banks, and that you say, you know, some of their policies are exactly as um, you know, very similar to banks' policies. I think in the same way, you know, what we found is that in some senses the um, DFIs are actually lagging the commercial banks, particularly in their um, policies around financing of fossil fuels, um, where commercial banks are looking at fossil fuel phase out and, and commitments to not finance coal or at least certain types of coal. We haven't seen any such um, commitments from the development uh, finance institutions. Um, I think, Leanne, would you like to respond a bit more particularly, a bit specifically to Jonathan as well, though? Thanks, Glenn. Um, and I think um, my response could potentially also cover a little bit of the question that Benedetti is asking in the chat. Um, I think what's really crucial, um, and, and we've referred to this very briefly by posting um, two of the reports that has been done by the coalition already, is that the basis of the coalition is to analyze the policies of the DFIs that we collectively cover and to be able to specifically understand the commitments of the DFIs as, as it relates to particular uh, climate related issues. Um, so the two reports that we have uh, done already, for example, would look at the policies of the DBSA and the IDC. Um, and one of the reports looked at the transparency of particular policies of the new developer because it speaks to something that Jonathan raised around the turnaround of people at the DFIs. So we're not necessarily, I mean, we are engaging with specific people at the DFIs and we are trying to build relationships and ensure that that engagement um, is really productive. But we want to be able to pin them to very specific specific and particular policy positions, including um, policies that exclude fossil fuels, the financing of fossil fuels. So you're looking at 
what are the objectives of these DFIs legislatively? And what are the parameters of the financing and how can we influence um, uh, those parameters and those objectives? And I think it's also important to recognize uh, as we've all done uh, throughout this conversation, uh, the changing environments in which they operate. So the climate finance deal being one um, and being a specific opportunity that allows for government, the, the task team uh, to operate parallel to specific legislative changes that are taking place and to really use uh, political power and leverage and negotiation to advance a just transition. So um, I really want to, to, to kind of emphasize the role that research plays using a very specific fair finance methodology that has been used around the world that has been well tested in order to analyze and comment on and then engage with DFIs around their policies. Um, you know, we've also engaged uh, informally as a coalition through parliamentary processes already. You know, we've had a, a particular parliamentary round table that looked at the DBSA and the IDC and the ECIC and we've raised questions about the transparency of particular processes and policies of those banks. Um, and, and we are, in, in, indeed looking at and considering uh, what our options are in respect of, of litigation as well. And I'm sure that um, you know, other coalition members can reflect on these questions um, more and be able to provide more context in respect of the work that we're doing. Thanks, Leanne. If other coalition members would also like to come in and um, add to what Leanne and I have said, please do. Um, it would be good to hear from the other members in the coalition, particularly to Benedette's question, which is quite wide in terms of what is our plan going forward. Um, maybe just to, to add to what Leanne said in the meantime, I think definitely the, the core of our work will be the policy assessment that Leanne has mentioned. Um, we also have plans um, for the next two years to be doing things like looking at case studies of specific projects and how the impact of those projects are having on communities specifically. I think Leanne also mentioned earlier that our role is not only to engage directly with the DFIs, but also to communicate um, what is happening at the DFIs uh, and to try and make sure that there is transparency for people affected by projects and for the public in general. These are after, after all public finance institutions. Um, so that's another big part of our role. Um, in terms of Parliament as well, Leah mentioned the round table that um, happened last year. We are also looking at um, asking questions to members of Parliament around specific projects that DFIs are involved in um, to see that the correct parliamentary oversight has been carried out there. So just another um, check if any other of the coalition members on the call would like to um, talk to any of the work that they have been leading on. Um, perhaps, uh, Marianne, I'm not sure if you'd like to mention um, Oxfam's work, particularly on the um, New Development Bank. Sure, thanks very much, Glenn. Um, Marianne's from Oxfam, South Africa, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. No, yeah, so um, uh, Oxfam, has, Oxfam South Africa has been working for several years now on the role of the New Development Bank, both in South Africa and in the region. Um, we also worked very closely on the study that Leanne mentioned related to information disclosure and grievance mechanisms. So, I, I mean, just in terms of the few years we've been engaged in this work and how I, I uh, understand other coalition members have similar challenges with the respective DFIs that they engage with is the um, just being able to interpret the policies and the frameworks in which the DFIs operate. We have a number of our network members that are you know, academics, that are involved um, in the legal sectors, um, and uh, you know, as well as development finance experts, but still we find ourselves running around in circles to try and understand how to apply these policies and hold the NDB to account. And so right now we've been focused, especially in terms of support to communities and how communities are affected, um, you know, working together also on uh, various advocacy initiatives um, 
for example, in um, with the NDB loan, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, working with the survivors for Lesotho uh, survivors of Lesotho dams, uh, with communities also in Lepalale affected by the Madupi coal power station, and also uh, forward looking into what the just transition means for these communities. So. Um, yeah, if I, I think that uh, the kinds of partnerships that we've had, for example, with CALS, to look at, look at um, some of the challenges on access to information and using the, um, the country system. So in this case, uh, the use of PIA to access information, it is quite shocking, for example, uh, and maybe I can um, wrap up here, that five years after the operations of the NDB in South Africa, in Lesotho, and now expanded to four other countries in, in different regions, have these policies in place, but yet fail to be able to implement in practice the policies that they say um, that they're meant to in order to promote themselves as an accountable and transparent institution. So I think a, a lot, and I'm, and, you know, I'm so glad that Fair Finance has focused um, its launch and the theme in terms of uh, transparency and accountability, because it's so difficult uh, to be able to do a lot of the work that we would like to with communities in looking at the importance of uh, uh, positive environmental and social impacts of these development projects, if it's so difficult to uh, you know, access basic information. Um, and so I think together with others, it's always much easier for bringing the various organizations that have been working in this space as opposed to um, you know, working uh, uh, um, uh, on separate initiatives because there's so much um, that we can learn from each other and so much we can do by working together. So I think in my view that that is a, a fantastic value add in terms of a coalition like Fair Finance um, and, and working with the, the various organizations that take part. Um, and just lastly, um, another example of um, uh, you know, looking at ways we can leverage our work together was a letter, I think it was uh, Leanne had posted a letter that we've uh, addressed to the finance minister again um, for in preparation for the, the budget speech holding um, Treasury accountable for, I believe it's over 2 billion US dollars that has been loaned to South Africa by the IMF, the World Bank, the NDB and the African Development Bank without again, uh, very little information in terms of how these loans have been spent for what purpose um, and uh, challenges we're experiencing in terms of um, the consultations that they were meant to have, at least for the world, the recent World Bank loan for 750 million US dollars. So I think you can read more about the letter and some of the de details around this, and in particular, a call that we're um, asking. Um, we've we've written already previously to Treasury to set up an engagement group for civil society to uh, have some kind of platform to engage uh, Treasury on um, the various DFIs that operate in the country. But yeah, thanks very much, Glenn. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for that. And thank you to Leanne and uh, Case and others who have been posting in the chat some of these resources that we've been mentioning. There's a lot to dive into there. And just particularly to highlight um, what Case uh, shared is also the methodology that we use for the policy assessments again which form the core of the work of the coalition. Um, Dean uh, from African Climate Reality Project has his hand up so I'm going to go to him and then quickly try and um, uh, answer Guy's question in the chat and I think that's all the time we'll have for questions at the moment. So Dean over to you. Thank you, thank you Glenn, thank you everyone. So I just really wanted to reiterate and um, expand the points that Marianne had spoken on earlier on. Apologies um, for if you didn't catch that earlier on. My name is Dean Bebe. I'm the campaigns coordinator at the African Climate Reality Project. And I just wanted to speak around how we can leverage really the coalition and how it's very important, specifically 
uh, targeting it for us, especially as the as ACRP, the African Development Bank, in terms of transparency and 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 accountability. And we've been engaging for them for several years now, really regarding the fossil fuel finance exclusion policy. And um, the small win that we've had recently it was really them publishing a date uh, in terms of them committing to some sort of phasing out of fossil fuels. But again, like what um, the earlier speaker did mention around how this is around the area of 51st states where we are in a space where a lot of things are promised, but um, the next day literally it's forgotten. And um, this has really also been experienced through in November last year as we led up to COP26, there was this, there was a, a consultation process with CSOs across Africa where we consulted with so many CSOs on the stance of the African Development Bank as a finance institution. And we wanted to really offer meaningful engagement to try and foster some sort of transparency and accountability mechanism within the bank's uh, structural frameworks. And just an hour before the event was meant to be launched out in the, at the COP26 AFDB pavilion side event, uh, the AFDB canceled that event um, and they just basically kicked civil society to the curb. And that has been um, the bank really throughout the years trying to manage the situation um, instead of really targeting and really offering meaningful engagement. And just as Leanne mentioned earlier uh, on around the, mil uh, the millions and the billions of money that's been invested towards the trust transition pact, the coalition wants to thrive to really look into how that's going to be distributed. Um, the most awkward aspect of it really is how we have the AFDB distributing that, but they are still committed to dirty fossil fuels such as coal and gas and oil. Uh, so to a large extent, we want to see how that would work in terms of the green transition in South Africa and how that can be an equitable phase out, one that's very inclusive for all walks of life in South Africa and Africa as a whole. But fundamentally, I think the coalition would help to really narrow down that focus on accountability and transparency and to create that mechanism as to do the investments that are created through different portfolios in the bank actually do reach communities and how we can also measure that impact in the long run. Thanks, Liv. Thank you, Dean. So quickly to um, just address Guy's question in the chat was asking about um, renewable energy and making sure that that is um, the money or the development finance that goes to that goes to local um, companies and local communities. It isn't that's something that many of our partners and members have addressed in the run up to the launch um, and is something that I know our own organization 350africa.org um, has been calling for. Um, it's not a primary focus of the coalitions, but it is definitely something that we will um, champion. I think we also understand the need, you know, to not be um, essentially selling off our renewable assets um, in terms of wind and sun to foreign um, companies to make sure that the country does benefit from that. So while our primary focus um, in the coalition is the things that have been mentioned, climate change, transparency and accountability, um, that is something that we will we will take up as well. So I think we'll leave it there for the questions. Thank you everyone who asked questions. If you'd like to follow up with additional questions, Nicole has posted our email address in the chat. It's info at fairfinancesouthafrica.org. So you can also see it on the website. So please do follow up with us if you would like to. Um, otherwise, I will hand back over to Ariella now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Glenn, and, and thanks to all of the colleagues and the, and the partner organizations who, who've spoken and shared their passion and, and really the, the very broad scope of the work that we're all doing, but that this coalition is, is now being um, established to focus on and, and to bring us as, as, as a focal point for this work. So I think that you can all see that we're all very excited about this and, and we really appreciate um, your attendance of our launch event. We ask you to continue keeping up to date with, with the coalition and, and with its, its movements and its, its conduct. Um, as, as we've highlighted, look out for our op-ed, go onto our website, look out for the upcoming um, longer video, go, to, go visit the mural, use the hashtag FairFinanceSA and, and follow along with what we're doing. No doubt we'll all be paying very close attention to what the minister says on Wednesday and what comments, if any, he makes around this space, and we'll be holding him to account. 
um, and we're just very, very excited to go forward. So as Leanne and, and other partners alluded to, this is part of, of a general international movement, but also a particular one called Fair Finance International. Um, Case has posted in, in the chat um, the Fair Finance methodology that we'll be a, a applying. And we're just really thankful for you for to you for joining us. And um, we very quickly at the end went to introduce our coordinator, Fair Finance South Africa, Kabonina Masango. So if you send an email to the email address that Nicole posted, um, info at Fair Finance South Africa, you'll be put in touch with Kabonina. You can forward any additional questions to her there that will be passed on to the rest of the coalition members. But otherwise at 11 o'clock on the dot, we just want to say thank you so much again for joining us. And I think that's sufficient to close off the event for now. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. There's Kabonina. Thanks Kabonina. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending our virtual press conference. Um, as um, Ariella mentioned, I'm the Fair Finance South Africa coordinator, and any emails I send will um, direct come to me, and then I will be sure to email you back promptly. Great. Thank thanks, you. Kavanina, and thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, all. Thank Bye -bye. you all.